NET, Indonesia, take one. following program is from NET, the National Educational Television Network. In August of 1965, at the Summer Palace in Indonesia, a most unusual charade is in progress. President Sukarno dances to a Russian folk song, sung by the Russian ambassador, no less, and the wife of Sukarno's communist deputy premier, Subandrio. One might assume that Sukarno is a puppet dancing to the Soviet tune. But the facts are even more fantastic than that. A communist plot is indeed brewing for a violent takeover of Indonesia and its 107 million people. But the chief plotter, Indonesia's Communist Party chief Deepa Aidit here, probably hasn't even let the Russians know about it, since his co-conspirators are the Chinese communists. The coup d'etat, only weeks away, is destined to fail by the narrowest margin. Communism is to experience the most serious setback in its half century of existence. President Sukarno, dancing on the brim of a volcano, will end up as a puppet, all right, but one who will dangle from strings held by a couple of his own generals. The chief puppeteer today is General Nasution, defense minister at the time of the coup, and one of those the communists had marked for murder. Helping him operate the strings that control Sukarno is General Suharto, who also escaped death and almost single-handedly defeated the attempted takeover, thus saving a vast area of Southeast Asia from Chinese domination. Why did Sukarno permit the communists to prepare their assault on his government? Was he actually a participant in the plot? What lies ahead now for Indonesia and for its once all-powerful ruler, who no longer has any power and so isn't a ruler at all? After the autumn of 1965, few leaders in any land enjoyed the power and prestige of President Sukarno. His intense popularity stemmed partly from his charm and oratory, but even more from the fact that it was he who led Indonesia to independence after three and a half centuries of colonial rule under the Dutch. He called himself Bapak, Daddy, and that's how the people of Indonesia regarded him, as a father image almost a divine father image. Much of this reverence for the man still lingers among a great many Indonesians, which is probably the chief reason why those who dictate what he can and cannot do have not swept him off the stage altogether. Another may be that he, more than anyone else, brought together into a cohesive nation all the many diverse nationalities of Indonesia. He gave them not only a common flag, but a common language. He built schools which raised the rate of literacy from practically zero to well over 50%. Now, almost every Indonesian child was assured of an elementary education, and if he had talent, even more than that. Indonesia is the fifth most populous nation on earth, but before Sukarno liberated and unified it, the Indonesians thought of themselves as nothing more than slaves of the Western imperialists. Sukarno changed all that, giving them a sense of identity and importance. He convinced them that Indonesia could become the leader among the world's emerging nations, a concept that caught their imaginations and turned them around. For the first time, they took pride in being Indonesian. They joined Sukarno in his hatred for the Westerners who had oppressed them, and by projection, all Westerners. The children absorbed all this as part of their history lessons, chanting the sing-song slogans like prayers.
Youngsters enjoying the new almost universal education were left with no doubts as to who made it possible, Big Daddy. The Sukarno portrait hung in every classroom. Some teachers devoted more time to politics than to the three R's. How much of the political dogma they were forced to memorize actually was retained by the children is questionable. But one thing is certain. They were determined to be good Indonesians. And to be a good Indonesian meant, first of all, to be loyal to Sukarno. So loyalty he got. Loyalty that was exuberant, rabid, in fact, and much more widely shared than that enjoyed by Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, or any other all-powerful ruler of recent times. What then went wrong? What brought Sukarno down? One small thing was his defiance of the mores of his people in regard to marital relations. He flagrantly maintained alliances with numerous women, including half a dozen wives, to four of whom he is still married today. The wife he favored most, as he still does, is Davy, number five, who presides over the presidential palace in Jakarta, while wife number six keeps house at the summer palace in Bogor. Davy is a most attractive woman, but there are many Indonesians who took exception to the fact that she is a foreigner and also that she was, prior to her marriage, a hostess in a Tokyo bar. Since her marriage, great controversy has raged around the head of this Eurasian girl, but she has pretended to be totally unaware of it, going her quiet way, smiling, subdued, and beautiful. She makes pleasant conversation, keeps an elegant and orderly household, and amuses herself with such unpolitical things as music. Sukarno's multiple alliances and marriages, particularly the one with Devi, were most irritating to Indonesia's female population, especially to women of the Muslim faith. Since the Muslims make up 85 to 90 percent of the population, it took some doing on Sukarno's part to keep their resentment under control. That he managed it right up to the time of the abortive coup is even more remarkable in light of the fact that his relations with women were only one of several causes of Muslim discontent. Another very serious one was that during the 10 years Sukarno gave the communists preeminence among Indonesian political parties, the Muslim party was almost suppressed. All in all, Sukarno, who is himself a nominal Muslim, acted in a very non-Muslim, you might say anti-Muslim manner. In due time, the Muslims would react with surprising violence. Sukarno's third mistake was his wild military adventurism in a country just emerging from colonialism, ravaged by the four-year fight for independence and with its economy disrupted, he poured a disproportionate share of the nation's wealth and manpower into the army. He was undoubtedly motivated, at least in the beginning, by the need to maintain order among his own people, with all their clamoring voices in many languages. But very quickly, urged on by his communist advisors, he began to beat the drum for military campaigns outside Indonesia's own borders. He set his sights on the addition of Dutch New Guinea to Indonesia's territory and mobilized a military force to bring this about. It was largely through American intervention at the United Nations, rather than his own might, that gave Sukarno New Guinea, just as the U.S. earlier had been instrumental in gaining Indonesian independence from the Netherlands. But even with New Guinea under his belt, Sukarno was not content. His next target was the new nation of Malaysia, against which he declared his second war. 
With the British protecting Malaysia, nothing came of this adventure except further strain on the Indonesian economy. All of this marching to and fro, all the flag waving and shouting and threats proved interesting and exciting to the Indonesians, who were slow to see the relationship between Sukarno's military ambitions and the steady decline of the economy. Most of them believed, at least for a while, Sukarno's claim that the shortages, high prices, and widespread unemployment were the result of an imperialist conspiracy against him. Here on the island of Borneo, as elsewhere in Indonesia, life grew harder and harder, although no one starved. The Indonesian earth is very fertile. So while rice, the staple food, was in short supply, there were other equally nourishing, if less desirable, foods available. Most of the 107 million people of Indonesia live on or near the water. Here in Borneo, there is hardly a town of any size that is not located either on the ocean or on a river. They drink the water, travel on it, bathe in it, discharge into it. Disease is rampant. Since among the foreign aid missions Sukarno kicked out of the country in his campaign of xenophobia were those providing medical supplies and assistance. The cost of maintaining one company of troops could have paid for enough vaccine to protect this entire island. But the vaccine was not forthcoming. While these poor people continued to have faith in Sukarno, their resentment began to rise toward the communists, who were assuming greater and greater influence. Outright control, in fact, of many phases of national life. The word Gestapo, borrowed from the German, became well known and thoroughly feared and despised. But Borneo, Sumatra, and Celebes had another special cause for complaint all their own. Many of these seagoing people have made a living for generations by smuggling to Malaya, Singapore, and the Philippines. The war with Malaysia broke up the smuggling operations and left the former smugglers idle and surly. And so the economy stagnated in a hundred different ways. With more than two-thirds of the national budget going to support the military, and much of the rest being devoted to prestige projects dreamed up by Sukarno, there was nothing left to maintain normal service. Ancient cars and trucks became a patchwork of parts, cannibalized from even older vehicles. Four out of five of Jakarta's buses no longer made their runs. Streets and roads became full of potholes. Repairs weren't just delayed, they simply didn't take place. This filling station where gasoline is poured into the tank from a five gallon can was typical of the hand to mouth state of Indonesian industry generally. Although Indonesia is itself a petroleum producer, Sukarno had ordered out the foreign oil companies and their technicians. This was the result. Fortunately for them, most Indonesians had never learned to depend on automobiles or other modern conveniences. They had managed for themselves from infancy and continued to do so. Their means of transport remained mostly their feet, sometimes aided by pedals.
With a bamboo yoke across his shoulders, an Indonesian can easily bounce a hundred pound load along at a slow trot for many miles. But the country is too populous to permit its citizens to provide all the necessary services themselves. Java, the capital island, is the most heavily populated place in the world. Its 60 million people are crowded into an area about the size of Alabama. Cities and towns merge into each other and traffic flows day and night. So many people living so close together create urgent needs for public health control, food distribution, capital investment, public transportation, and a hundred other things the Sukarno government was failing to provide. And Sukarno did not have the excuse of other leaders of revolutions that his country was too poor. Indonesia is the third most richly endowed nation on earth, preceded only by the United States and Russia in its supplies of oil and mineral deposits, including tin, as well as rubber, spices, copra, tobacco, coffee, and other farm products. But production of all these things was so disrupted by the nationalization of foreign holdings that Indonesia became as poor as the most backward nation in Africa. In rural areas, the breakdown of the economy was less apparent, although here too jobs were lost when foreign rubber, petroleum, and copra companies were put out of business. Fortunately though, as we've said, the fertility of the land assured that everyone would eat enough to sustain life. There is a saying here that if you stick a twig into the ground, it will grow leaves next week and fruit next year. Another saying goes, rice crops twice a year, children once. Rice, children, and the hard-working water buffalo. These are the things that are important in rural Indonesian life. Because of the soaring population, Indonesia's rice paddies, productive as they are, cannot grow enough to meet the national requirements. In the best of times, this agricultural nation falls short by more than a million tons a year. The bamboo arches over rural roads exhorted the farm workers to redouble their efforts, supposedly arousing them by citing Indonesia's military might and its importance as a world power. But even if the slogans had been effective, it's fairly certain that not enough rice could be produced. Until Indonesia isolated herself, the rice deficit had been made up by imports. But that takes foreign exchange, and Sukarno no longer had any. And so the price of rice went up and up to 10 times what it had been 20 years before. The few primitive railroads were in as rundown a condition as other public services. This one carries a few hundred unemployed rural people toward Jakarta, where they will add to the tremendous jam up already existing there. In the capital, the shortage of foreign exchange never appeared to bother those who were connected with the Sukarno administration. There were plenty of modern cars on the streets and luxury goods in the shops. The black market thrived, and when the bubble burst, one Sukarno lieutenant was found to have acquired a nest egg of $17 million, presumably from graft and black market operations. If you were on the inside, you could afford shoes at 25,000 rupees and dark glasses just like those worn by Big Daddy. Meanwhile, Sukarno moved the country closer to total fiscal ruin with lavish building projects, such as a 300-foot obelisk topped with a solid gold torch worth $300,000.
He started work on a $12 million hotel, a $100 million sports stadium, the world's largest mosque, one of the largest department stores anywhere, just the sort of things his people needed. $300,000 for a gold torch when the marketplace was empty of all but the simplest commodities. A few chickens, some vegetables, cigarettes, candy, bolts of cloth, and a very limited supply of used household equipment. To buy any of the goods on display took, each week, a larger bundle of rupees than the week before. Whether by design or inadvertence, Sukarno had, in a variety of ways, brought his country to a point of chaos in which it was ripe for a takeover by somebody, and the communist leaders were waiting in the wings. They had plenty of support among the people, an estimated three and a half million members enrolled in PKI, the Indonesian Communist Party, plus another 20 million members of various front groups. It was the largest and strongest communist organization outside the communist bloc of nations. Communists controlled the press, the banks, the central labor organization, the peasants' front, most of the departments of the government, they even counted at least a fourth of the troops in the army among their ranks. The original plan, later revealed, had been to delay the takeover until 1970. But Sukarno, with communist help, had brought the Indonesian economy to such a state of paralysis that the communists decided they had to act sooner, perhaps before someone else did. <laughs> When the price of a month's ration of rice reached half a month's salary for the average worker, the bottom of the barrel had at last been reached. The message went out from Peking to Jakarta and from there to party leaders throughout Indonesia. The coup is set for September 30th, 1965. <laughs> These rank-and-file communists undoubtedly were not let in on the timetable, but each of them would have an assignment to kill, destroy crops, raid warehouses, kidnap, shut down all industry, commit sabotage, and help bring on general anarchy. It wouldn't be true anarchy, though, for this man, Deepa Idit, would be in command. And the key to his plan was the immediate capture and murder of the eight top anti-communist generals. Idit was ready. And on September 30th, the blow fell. Next morning, the bodies of six of the eight key generals, brutally mutilated, were found in this well. But two of the eight had escaped, and that was the coup's undoing. Defense Minister Nasution had evaded death by clamoring over a wall, but the assassins killed his five-year-old daughter. Now the little girl and the six generals would become national heroes. A wave of revulsion swept through the country as the leading victims of the communist revolt were carried ceremoniously to interment. Had the assassination of all eight of the only men the communists feared been completely successful, the six whose remains lie under these stones would still be in an unmarked grave. Indonesia would be part of the Chinese Communist Empire. The effects on the rest of Southeast Asia and the entire world are incalculable. Even before the funeral ceremonies, the counterattack on the communists was well underway, directed by General Suharto, commander of the Army Strategic Reserves, who had avoided assassination because he was at the hospital bedside of one of his children during that fateful night. When he learned what had happened, he assumed leadership of the army on his own authority, mobilizing a single battalion and counterattacking and retaking communications and military command centers that had been seized by the communists. At this point, Sukarno might have prevented Suharto's counterattack by ordering the troops not to follow him, but he did not. Why he did not may be debated forever.
As Suharto's small military unit spread consternation among the superior communist forces, breaking the back of the suddenly leaderless revolt, hundreds of thousands of ordinary Indonesians leaped into the struggle. There was a storm of indignation throughout the country. The long pent-up antagonism toward the communist Gestapo-like intrusions into their lives broke out in an orgy of destruction. There were mass killings of unheard of proportions. As the army and police looked the other way, Indonesians went on a rampage that reminded some of the excesses of the French Revolution. Communist Party headquarters everywhere in the country were sacked and burned, as was the Chinese embassy in Jakarta. There were reports of rivers being clogged with bodies. In all, estimates of the number killed range from 300,000 to 500,000. Meanwhile, the military were not just passively observing the slaughter. Furious at the murder of its leading generals, the army set out to destroy the Communist Party. Many of the Communist chiefs, including the top man, Deepa Aidit, were summarily executed when captured. But the Communist resistance went on, and even now, red guerrilla bands still operate in remote sections of the country. The army continues to devote much of its time and personnel to running them down. The effects of the bloodbath and the continuing pursuit of the communists has been highly disruptive of life everywhere in the country. But although there must still be many communists left from among the millions of adherents the party once had, there is no discernible demand from anyone except Sukarno to lessen the pressure on them. These ordinarily calm, phlegmatic people who all by themselves, without any outside assistance whatever, were the first anywhere to defeat a major communist takeover attempt, are not in a mood to reverse themselves now. And although ordinarily calm, they are, after all, Malayans, who when enraged can become truly terrible opponents. The phrase running amok originally described a Malayan illness, a sudden access of madness. This ritual dance portrays in stylized form how when the Malays are sufficiently aroused, the madness can be self-induced, and when it is, woe to their enemies. By no means were all the communists and suspected communists put to death. Many thousands were captured and interrogated. Their persons and their homes searched for evidence. Tons of documents were thus obtained showing clearly how well planned the coup had been. Evidence was also found implicating a number of Sukarno's closest associates in the communist plot. That Sukarno himself was also implicated is assumed by most observers since the president is known to have spent the night of September 30th at the headquarters of the revolt with its top leaders, fleeing to his summer palace only when word came back that two of the generals marked for death had escaped and were counterattacking. If there is fatal evidence against Sukarno, it has not been made public, not yet at any rate. It may be the documents and testimony linking Sukarno directly with the plot are being held over his head by the generals as a means of keeping him in line. 
the mass of evidence that has been published shows that had the communist plans gone through, there would have been a bloodbath almost as severe as the one that actually took place, except that these prisoners would then have been the executioners and their captors, the victims. Each day, the prisoners listened to long anti-communist lectures, whose effectiveness it is impossible to measure. Daily exercise keeps the prisoners alive until their turn comes to go on trial. The court dockets are so long that some of these people may never have their cases heard. The trials have been underway for more than a year now. And even the cases of the communist leaders have not all been disposed of as yet. In the parade of defendants coming before the military judges is communist deputy chief Jono, who was found months after the coup disguised as a bird dealer in the Jakarta marketplace. He is defended by a Dutch woman lawyer whose chief argument on his behalf is that the communists were only acting to forestall an uprising by right-wing generals. But this is countered with evidence that the communists had been preparing their coup for more than 10 years. Jono is sentenced to death. Lieutenant Colonel Untung commander of the palace guard and the man who led the detail that tortured and killed the six generals, a key figure in the red plot. Untung's testimony implicates Sukarno in the conspiracy, but the court isn't interested in pursuing such a line of evidence, not yet. For Untung also, the sentence is death. In the minds of Indonesians, one whole segment of the population, the Chinese residents, are put on trial and found guilty. Partly this condemnation stems from the fact that Chinese merchants paid extortion money to the PKI under threats from Peking of retaliation against their relatives in China. But the order expelling from the country many thousands of Chinese, some of them fourth or fifth generation Indonesians, is probably more traceable to the fact that the Indonesians are strongly prejudiced against them. The hard-working, smart, and successful Chinese has always been a thorn in the side of the easy-going, often lazy and envious Indonesian. Now these people without country are deported en masse. They can't go back to China, and many wouldn't if they could. Most of them will wind up in Hong Kong. Bowing to public bigotry by uprooting Chinese residents does not solve any of Indonesia's manifold problems. Among the difficulties faced by the generals now in charge, especially General Nasution, is the refusal of President Sukarno to concede that he is no longer really Big Daddy. The president calls the generals together as though he were still all-powerful, and amiably they respond. General Suharto, now the number two man under Nasution, goes along with the pretense that Sukarno can order them around because it is, after all, his pretense as much as Sukarno's. But then Sukarno starts laying down the law to them. He defends his political cronies and denounces not the communist coup in which they took part, but the efforts of the general since then to stamp out communism. He thinks it's terrible to deprive the communists of the right to vote and to have their representatives in the parliament. Then Sukarno drops his little bombshell. He is taking back into the cabinet the pro-communist ministers that Nasution and Suharto had forced him to dump. Furthermore, he is dismissing General Nasution as Minister of Defense. 
the gall of the man is really quite remarkable. But equally remarkable is the restraint of General Nasution on hearing that the puppet Sukarno has decided to dispense with the puppeteer, Nasution. It isn't Nasution who was to put Sukarno in his place. This most patient of men mollifies his fellow generals who want to strike Sukarno down and decides to let the youth of Indonesia make its mind and muscle felt. More than 100,000 college and high school students from all parts of the country abandon their classrooms to storm through the streets of Jakarta, demanding Nasution's restoration to office, Sukarno's resignation, and the death of Foreign Minister Subandrio. For days, the students besiege the presidential palace. They force Sukarno to bring in his ministers by helicopter. Sukarno orders the university closed and calls for police action to disperse the students. But the demonstrations go on. Anti-communist, anti-Sukarno slogans are scrawled on walls everywhere in the city. No longer is it, United States go to hell. Now the recommendation is directed at the communists. Finally, Sukarno is forced to back down. He dumps Subandrio and hands over power officially to General Suharto, who heads a triumvirate that will henceforth administer with General Nasution as its chief consultant. There will be further threats and bombast out of this man, but now everyone knows he is no longer ruler, just a mouthy figurehead. So there comes a new arrangement of the political forces in Indonesia. At the top, firmly in control, is the army purged of its communist members. Close behind in influence stand Indonesia's anti-communist student organizations, with the youngsters divided up into companies patterned after the militaries. The country's political parties rank behind the military and the students. The communists, of course, are no longer one of those parties. Suharto has outlawed the PKI. The university has been reopened and is the center of the student anti-communist crusade. These activists call themselves the 66th generation, a label Nasution gave them after their successful siege of the presidential palace last year. Their political agitation includes the broadcasting of lively commentaries over the university radio station, an activity still technically against the law, but tolerated by those now in power. The students also delight in broadcasting rock and roll music, a form of defiance of Sukarno, who thoroughly detests it. But the young people of Indonesia seem to be in danger of becoming full-time agitators. Many classrooms remain abandoned, the students outplaying politicians and soldiers, having too much fun to worry about academic work. The banishment of communist teachers who once predominated has also left a vacuum that can't be quickly filled. Indonesia's educational program, Sukarno's biggest contribution to the country, is being sent back at least several years. Here, the students rally to demand the end of Indonesia's senseless war against Malaysia. One effect of demonstrations is to speed up developments that would take place anyhow, but not until months or years later. Adult Indonesians have a phrase, balloom, balloom, which means later, later. Let's not hurry things. Once we commit ourselves, we are committed. But the young are more impatient. They don't believe in balloon balloon. What they want, they want now, now. And this catalyzing agitation makes them the political force they are in Indonesia today.
rakyat Indonesia sudah maju, sudah tahu siapa mereka yang berani, berani membela revolusi untuk rakyat. Dan siapa yang berjuang untuk membela seseorang atau sekelompok. Even after the Indonesian government had already put out peace feelers to Malaysia, Sukarno persisted in efforts to conduct his own separate foreign policy. Here he welcomes the communistically inclined foreign minister Bhutu of Pakistan and declares that if Indonesia is to be a great power, she must resume the war with Malaysia. He also attempts through Bhutu to work out a resumption of severed relations with communist China. An irritated world has reason to ask, who is running Indonesia anyhow? The new government quickly sets the record straight, which is too bad for Foreign Minister Bhutu, for when he returns home, he will learn that he has been thrown out of the Pakistani government. Sukarno is also due to receive unpleasant news, for here, with General Suharto looking on, the Indonesian and Malaysian foreign ministers are about to sign a treaty ending the war between the two nations. Everyone has reason to be pleased about the conclusion of the unhappy conflict. Everyone, that is, except Sukarno and the Chinese communists into whose arms the Malaysian fiasco had driven him. General Suharto has taken the first step toward bringing his country into normal relations with the rest of the world. The Malaysians present him with a personal gift, symbolizing the need for peaceful competition and friendly relations between the two young countries. The meeting then adjourns to the nearest golf course and Suharto's favorite recreation. General Suharto has come a long way in just a couple of years from being just another army officer to chief of state of a nation of 107 million people. Sukarno, meanwhile, just never gives up. He attempts to pass off the heaviest defeat of his career as a victory by receiving the Malaysian peace delegation like a triumphant sultan. Many conclude that the eccentric ex-dictator has lost touch with reality. However, there are enough of his former trappings and honors left to him to help explain some of his grandiose ideas. For example, his chair remains in a place of honor in the Hall of Parliament. Sukarno himself is not present at this meeting in June 1966, at which a general attack on virtually all of his domestic policies will be started. After a prayer for the murdered generals, the legislators demand a return of their authority under the Constitution, a return of powers, some of which they relinquished to Sukarno piece by piece over the years, and some of which he simply usurped. In addition to the political parties, the military are also strongly represented here and it is their wish to limit the presidency, which Sukarno occupies for life, to a purely functionary role with a maximum of three years duration. Unanimously, the legislators elect General Nasution, who had been dismissed by Sukarno as Minister of Defense to become the President of the Chamber, which makes him, officially, the second man in the government next to Sukarno. But the vote for Nasution and the enthusiastic applause that follows it are one more public rebuke for Sukarno. And they leave no doubt in anyone's mind that Nasution is not number two. He's number one, Sukarno's successor, with Sukarno having no number at all. But then, next morning, with remarkable inconsistency to our Western way of thinking, the Parliament rolls out the red carpet for Sukarno, who has agreed to appear and read the budget prepared by the Triumvirate. 
Sukarno's sworn enemies greet him with Javanese courtesy and even some polite bows and applause. The former supreme ruler fidgets as he waits to assume a new role, that of the actor reading someone else's lines. Mrs. Sukarno is more skillful at pretending that all is well, but this is the first speech the president has ever made in which every sentence has been handed to him intact and inviolate. He does a brave job with it, but this is not the old Sukarno. Pengertian pemimpin besar revolusi. Dalam pidato saya ambek para maharta itu, his audience, while polite, does not overstrain itself in feigning interest in his words. MPRS, tetapi mengangkat saya juga menjadi pemimpin besar revolusi Indonesia. Demikian saya katakan. Saya menerima pengangkatan itu dengan sungguh rasa terharu. Now, with the prepared speech back in a military briefcase, Sukarno, still refusing to face reality, strikes out on his own, delivering a more impassioned statement he prepared himself. My tour of duty as president may be limited, he says, but I remain the great leader of the Indonesian revolution. I fought for the freedom of my land and yours. With Allah's help, I will continue to govern and lead you and all the Indonesian people to a better future. Again, the audience reaction is one of restraint. They have given perfunctory applause, but the statement that he is still the great leader brings more amusement than inspiration. General Suharto is pleased with the way the session has gone. However, all Indonesians do not share his satisfaction with the ambivalent position of the president. The Indonesian press, which when it was communist controlled, invariably kowtowed to Sukarno, now is openly scornful. Unless the papers have something particularly cutting to say, any news about Sukarno is relegated to the back pages. Newspapers mounted on billboards and displayed throughout the country, for the benefit of those who can't afford to buy their own, carry cartoons that are particularly harsh on Sukarno. They will continue to become even more so until General Suharto is impelled to limit the defamation of his puppet president. This past October, he even sent in troops to break up an anti-Sukarno demonstration by the student organizations. He has told military officers to make no public statements critical of Sukarno. The attitude of those now controlling Indonesia seems to be that there is no point in maintaining a figurehead in the presidency if he is to be a constant object of ridicule and abuse. Since October, Suharto has made it more and more clear that Sukarno is going to remain president for the predictable future, and everyone had better become adjusted to that fact. Perhaps the placid smile of Mrs. Sukarno may be accounted for by a suspicion on her part all along that this is the way things would turn out. There have been numerous reports that she had considerable influence in persuading her husband to accept the inevitable and enjoy the perquisites left to him by the new regime. So now Sukarno devotes his days to ceremonies such as this, at which he bestows an award on an Austrian architect who designed a skyscraper for him that was to have been the tallest building in Asia. This sort of thing is hardly enough to fill the time and the ambitions of a man who was going to reshape the entire world. With the architect, he revisits a display of drawings and models, 
of all the buildings that were to have made Jakarta a spectacular city, worthy of being the capital not only of Indonesia, but of all the newly emerging nations everywhere. With these visualizations, Sukarno can more easily bring to mind his super department store, his United Nations for those who don't like the one in New York, his sports palace, and the gigantic hotels that were to have accommodated a flood of diplomats, athletes, journalists, and tourists from all over the world. Of all his dream buildings still on the drawing board, the only one that's given a chance of being erected is the world's largest mosque. That's one project highly favored by the predominantly Muslim population. And as one member of parliament puts it, who would dare to oppose such a thing? The steel mill, the big new airport, and the other ambitious projects will remain on the shelf. Many hundreds of acres in Jakarta are strewn with the litter of construction started but never completed. Someday the buildings will probably be finished and put to use, but not now. Since the change of governments, foreign creditors, primarily Russia and the United States, have been working on plans for a moratorium on Indonesia's debts and possibly new assistance. But those creditors will not hold still for any further prestige building projects by a nation as destitute as this one. A few months ago, Indonesia reached its 21st year of independence. There was a stately ceremony in which Sukarno's daughter carried the Indonesian flag to the site at which the struggle for freedom would be celebrated with a gala flag raising. The old fire horse responded to the presence of a crowd as to a bell and launched into another of his speeches, filled with his unquenchable dreams of personal power. Speaking as if all the dramatic events of the preceding year had not occurred, he raged against the imperialists, talked about resuming the war against Malaysia, and ignored the fact that Indonesia had rejoined the United Nations by saying she could never do so without basic reforms in the UN's imperialistic structure. General Suharto stood there and took it as Sukarno proclaimed that Suharto, Nasution, and the other officials of the new government were nothing more than his assistants. But for each such outburst, there seems to be a counterbalancing humiliation for Sukarno. Shortly after this speech, Suharto decided that Sukarno's closest collaborator, Subandrio, must be prosecuted for his part in the communist coup. Subandrio was convicted and sentenced to death. For Sukarno, each untempered speech becomes more costly than the last. To the ordinary Indonesians, the shifting of power in Jakarta is of little direct personal importance. But they do know that lately there has been less rattling of sabers and less interference from the bureaucracy with the business of trying to overcome the country's rice deficit. There has been no drastic progress in closing the rice gap, but with the slow resumption of trade with other countries, there is the prospect of being able to offset the deficit, at least in part, with imports of rice from abroad. On the tobacco plantations, too, there is now less turmoil and mismanagement, so production is slowly creeping up again. But as in the petroleum industry, the country sorely misses the foreign technicians who used to direct the operations. Those technicians are not likely to return until they are assured it will be safe and profitable for them to do so. The rubber plantations were split by Sukarno into small plots growing what was called people's rubber. But rubber cannot be produced efficiently on small family plots, no matter what you call it. Proper care and replacement of the trees, scientific tapping of the sap, and the processing of the crude latex into a dried product ready for shipment, all require capital, technology, and equipment that unskilled, impoverished individual farmers cannot hope to provide.
Sutanto, the average Indonesian for the present, must be content if he and his family have only enough to eat. Rice remains the staple not only of the national diet, but of the national economy. No matter what happens to the rupiah, whether it rises or declines in value, the real measure of economic health is the price of a bowl of rice. Since many Indonesians now are paid partly in cash and partly in rice, rice is the currency that determines real prices and wages. At present, it is much too dear, taking far too many of a man's hours of hard labor. Spaghetti, however heavily spiced for the oriental tongue, becomes an unsatisfactory substitute. The first step in getting Indonesia's economy restarted will be to revive international trade. A few ships are here bringing in the needed machine parts and raw materials and taking away the still limited output of Indonesian mines, mills and plantations. But there will have to be a great fleet of such ships in operation before Indonesia can hope to approach anything near its great potential. The grandiose posturing represented by this entourage of official cars moving through the streets of Jakarta as though through the streets of Washington, London or Moscow will undoubtedly continue. All the emerging nations seem to need such displays to convince themselves that they're really on their way. The important thing is that no longer do the motorcycle escorts and fancy dress balls serve as a reinforcement for the delusions of an all-powerful dictator, helping to convince him that he is so important that nothing can restrain him or defeat his ambitions. Sukarno almost did have a tremendous effect on the world, but not in the way he hoped or expected. He came within a hair of driving all of Southeast Asia into the hands of the Chinese communists. Fortunately for everyone, he failed. Now Indonesia can begin anew to find a place for herself, and it should be an important place among the family of free nations. This has been NET Journal, a weekly look at the events, issues, and people of the world today. This is NET, the National Educational Television Network.